sector bring in India's decade by bringing innovation, inclusivity, while having a socio-economic impact? Thank you. Um, the task of the government was actually to ensure that um, the climate for uh, rollout of 5G is put in place in the first instance, while spectrum auction was part of the process. I think the preparation started a little uh, long ago, I mean, I think, means as early as uh, 2017 when, when we decided to set up a 5G test bed. So with IIT Madras and uh, several other IITs and uh, Samir, one of our research institutions. So the last several years have been hard work in terms of supporting, helping, assisting, facilitating the ecosystem players, especially the startups and the tech, uh, deep, deep tech startups to actually work on these technologies ahead of time. So while that be the, so, uh, the case, I think the government also took a lot of efforts in unlocking Spectrum because Spectrum doesn't come, I mean, it's already deployed in several other uses. So getting the Spectrum unlocked and uh, putting them to the market took a lot of effort. In fact, because there were several other stakeholders like Defense I mean, uh, and many other uh, users who had to part with a, a, uh, some of the Spectrum which could be then auctioned. Of course, the, uh, the auction process was, uh, itself took a lot of, uh, quite some time. But nevertheless, I think uh, at the end of the day, I mean, I would like to say that the, ta the, the job of the government as part of the auction process was to essentially put out more spectrum in the market because essentially India is one of the countries where the spectrum per population is, is actually low. I mean, in fact, for the kind of explosion in data which, is, which we're seeing now, we need more spectrum per population. So therefore, from that perspective, I think we have, uh, it's a good beginning and we believe that uh, this uh, uh, this will spawn not only new use cases because 5G is obviously a different technology with a number of enterprise use cases and also promises greater speed, lower latency, higher reliability and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, I think this is a great opportunity for innovation to happen because essentially innovation happens around new technology and I think 5G that way promises to be disruptive in its, uh, in its uh, use cases, I mean, I think. So, and therefore, from that perspective, we are quite excited. We will continue to work with the, with the industry to actually develop these use cases. We look forward to a very robust and a, and a planned long-term rollout. Thank you. Okay, so innovation is a key factor that you're keeping in mind. I want to talk, sir, a bit about inclusivity. 5G, they say, can help bridge India's digital divide. You know, while Telangana is making a lot of efforts to make sure optical fiber reaches every household in Telangana, the problem is... Uh, it's still very hard. Two-thirds of India is in rural areas where a cable of fiber finds it very hard to reach. Most of us have mobile connectivity, but the speeds are not very high. So when we switch to 5G, we will have very high speed and high quality broadband-like experience, which can usher in a lot of innovation, enable the use cases that you're talking about. So when this happens outside of the metros, it will help India bridge its digital divide. So my question is that 5G right now is going to be rolled out only in the key cities, in the metros, I think 11 in October, and it will take a couple of years before it becomes pan-India. So in a way, if the operators are right now going to cater to the creamy areas, only the metros, will it not deepen the digital divide rather than bridge it? Your thoughts on how 5G can foster inclusivity? Well, you know, all telecom networks, by very nature, start from a focal point, and then like a circle, they keep expanding. So that's the very nature of telecom networks, and 5G will be no different. So it's not surprising that they have to start from the cities, but my feeling is that the penetration of 5G handset, which is critical, because without 5G handsets, even if you provide the network, it won't work. So that is going to rise so quickly that... I, nobody can predict how many years it will take for it to go to the deep part of the country, but I think it will be much quicker than what we are all expecting. Your own estimate, when we could have 5G pan India? Well, I think we are in a 100 meter race, so keep running as fast as you can. <laughs> Don't worry about how long it takes. We'll do our level best to reach as soon as we can. Raja Raman, your thoughts on inclusivity? 5G uh, is... is new to most parts of the world, I, mean, I think, though of course a number of countries have launched it. The, gra the, the, the rollout will be gradual because as uh, and even the, the telecom service providers have taken a measured step because obviously they would like to see how revenues grow, etc. So it will be 
a measured rollout, 4G will continue to be the base load I mean, uh, system. While 4G, 5G builds up, it will definitely reach out to the rural areas. And let me also say this. See, today the 4G covers almost like 98% of the subscribers. Now the Honorable Prime Minister has taken the decision to actually do saturate the country with 4G. So the technology that we are going to adopt it will also be 5G enabled. To switch on 4G, 5G will not be very difficult. I think most of the technologies of 4G can be uh, upgraded to 5G without much of effort. So I think once the use cases build up, I think this country, the, the 5G will really explode. That's our ex ex expectation. And let me also say, see, the Indian uh, digital user is not to be underestimated. We lead in terms of the data use, you know, I think, and in fact, in the most parts, parts of the world, the average data use is about 12 GB per user per month. But India has already reached about 18, I, mean, I think, which I think is, shows that I think the uptake will be very fast. No, absolutely. I think 4G helped India's digital uh, consumption go up by six and a half times data consumption. Uh, Rajan, to take up on that point about use cases, uh, B2B value proposition of 5G can be well imagined, right? AI and 5G will help autonomous cars. We could have robotic surgeries taking place remotely in healthcare. But what about from a B2C point of view? Now, we still don't seem to have a killer 5G app or a use case for which we require 5G. Now, 4G enabled movie streaming, which was not earlier possible with 3G. What is it that you see from a customer consumer point of view will be the compelling use case for which you know, 5G is needed and that will drive adoption. Okay, I think I'll ask you a counter question. What was the killer use case for 4G? What was the killer use case for 3G? Typically, use cases do not generally, the killer ones, you don't see them born till you have the G rolled out. Now, I, I would like to touch up on the topic which was discussed as to what is going to happen in 5G in India. With 4G, we address the need of the mobile customer, right? And we talk about 12 GB, 19 GB, actually. That's sort of consumption per month, from 1 GB to 19 GB. And if I ask any one of us that what is it that you're doing which consumes 90, I don't think we have a very clear answer how we ended up using 19 GB. And it's still growing. What is missing is the connectivity in the home. Uh, broadband inside the home, especially during the pandemic, we all saw that all of us, the school moved inside the home, the office moved inside the home, and we needed broadband inside the home. With 5G, what you're going to see is that, especially with this super successful auction, and I would say it is one of the best things that has happened to this country, and as we watch global, and now we watch India, millimeter wave, and the way the government has managed to offer, and the operators have taken up the challenge, of huge, taking huge spectrum, millimeter wave is going to solve the issue of home broadband. So what I would see is that the home needed fiber. Fiber is a difficult proposition. It's going to take its own time. And with millimeter wave, you will see the home getting the fiber. That's the first consumer use case, because now you have broadband inside the home. Apart that, of course, you can talk about zillions of use cases. I think the operators, Airtel, Geo, Vodafone, have, over the last one year, during the trials, have showcased multiple use cases. I would still say that let's not define what's a killer use case. Basically, 5G is the need of this country primarily to exactly address the digital divide because 5G is going to be going to the rural. With millimeter wave, we are going to reach out to the end of the villages which had been difficult with fiber. So my belief is that 5G is going to be all pervasive very quickly. So from a B2C point of view, the biggest use case will be home broadband, fixed wireless access? To start with? To start with. Uh, Anand, coming to you on that, would you like to add any more potential use cases on B2C? And then we'll get chatting about B2B and the value proposition. See, as you said, I think on, on the B2C side, as, I mean, video will continue to be one of the biggest, but you know, you are already getting 4G, but how do you sort of look at ultra speed is going to be one of the killer use cases as we go along. And clearly, as uh, Rajan mentioned, these things will evolve as the, as the sort of, uh, as the network grows. If 4G was all about feeds and speeds, 5G will be about providing the experience to the end user. With more and more, you, with more and more developments happening in the case of, say, metaverse or in the case of AR, VR, 
how do you sort of provide the uh, shopper the same experience that you have when you're shopping? So I think those are the things that people will start working on as and when as in this becomes more and more ubiquitous. But I think, as you mentioned, the biggest benefit or biggest use cases will be on the B2B side. Today, telecom service providers gain a big chunk of their revenues from the consumer mobility side, and there is a huge opportunity on the enterprise side, which is what we are working closely with all the operators on. I think there, there is enormous potential across all of these areas. I mean, during the pandemic, some of us in the knowledge sector perhaps had the luxury of working for extended periods of time from home. How do you extend that? To, the, to, to beyond the knowledge sector workers. Why would they not have the luxury or the uh, advantage of having to work from wherever they want rather than working from there? That's where all the use cases of manufacturing, agriculture, all of these come into play. And I think that is where 5G will have a big role to play going forward is the way we see it. No, absolutely. Uh, I think 5G will form the backbone of digital infrastructure for enterprises. Let me also welcome Madhav Shed of Realme into the discussion now. Madhav, thank you very much for joining in. I want to complete the point about you know, 5G for consumers and then we'll get chatting about enterprise and how we can make India a global powerhouse. Now for 5G to be ubiquitous, we also need 5G enabled handsets to be fairly cheap. Hmm. What is the price range? That would be ideal. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for hosting me over here and thank you all the panelists. I've been uh, old friends to a few of them. I think uh, talking about the pricing of the 5G, the need of NR is to bring in more affordable 5G phones in India. For, because I always believe that basically if you do not have the devices, more affordable devices will not bring the adoption of 5G and that is extremely crucial. So we are really, even before the 5G services have launched, we were the first one to launch the 5G devices in India. We have already have more than 5 million users who already are on 5G in India at this point of time, uh, ranging from our all set of handsets and our more than 50% of the portfolio would be 5G. What we are trying to bring is about $100, $150 price segments, $150 plus price segments to bring to 5G as well. And I think that's what the vision we carry in 2022 and 2023. Probably doing that, I believe that basically because handsets, as I said, is one of the most crucial part for adopting 5G being the hub for controlling all the AIoT ecosystem devices. Where I said he said about B2B, I said B2C also would be one of the biggest thing. Everything around you, which is conventional, will move to smart. Which means that basically everything will be controlled through a smartphone. Which means that basically rural people will be more connected to the urbans. And that is the most important part where the AIoT ecosystem will come into play. So for us, the most important role is to make sure that how many more and more people come onto the 5G health devices. And for that, you're saying the price should be $150 or even lower? We have a handset already starting from $150. Right? Okay. What we are trying to bring is to bring more affordable 5G phones into the ecosystem. And that would be $100? That's something which is not possible at the current point of time, but probably yes. I think through the ecosystem players over a period of time, maybe it would be possible. It's also all about the economies of scale. It's not possible just on the segments, but the people adoption after the services roll out will also play a crucial factor on this particular fact. Uh, so just you know, one clarification since we're on the topic of uh, handsets. There was an article in the paper today which said that the government wants Chinese companies out of the sub-12,000 uh, category handset. Would you like to comment on that? Is that something that the government is thinking about? Uh, I wouldn't want to comment on that. <laughs> All right. Um, Akhil, um, on pricing, right? Globally, the experience has been that 5G pricing is not at a significant premium to 4G, maybe at best 10%. Uh, what is your sense of 5G pricing? And would you say that telecom companies and operators have not made a return which is commensurate with their capital expend investment into migrating from 3G to 4G. Now 4G for instance enabled a whole world of applications, right? It ushered in the app economy, it helped the rise of SaaS economies, but it's not that operators financially benefited so much. So your thoughts, first on 5G ARPU, how much higher do you think it can be and then do you think telcos have not been able to maximize and benefit from this? <clears throat> well, the financial health of the operators, you're touching a very raw nerve, so I'll talk about it later. Let me step back and talk about the use cases, though it's not part of the question, but it's very importantly linked to the pricing. I think one very important use case which we all miss 
is the mobile mobile services itself. I mean, the fact remains that with the handset penetration, 5G will be used for mobile services, the maximum. Then come the home broadband, then come the enterprises, and also please don't forget that all the technological advancement will need more and more bandwidth. Therefore, this is the bedrock that will be needed. On the pricing, well, I think it really depends on the scale. My feeling is that ultimately if the penetration of handsets is very quickly, it will be another service. And because of higher speeds, people will consume more data, which will give us more revenue. But yes, coming back to your main question, I guess the health of this industry has got to improve because this industry will keep requiring billions and billions of dollars of investment and weak financial companies or bankrupt companies can't do that. Only healthy financial companies can do it. So we do need to ensure that. Okay, that's a raw nerve, so I'm not going to delve more and talk more about it. But now let's talk about the promise of 5G in the B2B segment, in connecting enterprises, in the connected solution space, and the opportunity that it ushers in. Uh, Rajan, the TREI said that uh, 5G has predicted has TREI has predicted that 5G can have a cumulative economic impact of $1 trillion, not just in pure 5G connectivity, but in terms of the associated technologies like AI, IoT. Can you tell us how we can realize that? I think that's a very important point. And it's when you talk about just the $1 trillion economy, it's also about the number of jobs that it's going to create, right? It's associated with that. Um, a, actually, I don't, definitely don't want to miss the point about the handsets because I think I trivialized it, which is not true. Uh, but more or less in the world of 5G, handsets become incidental. Uh, till 4G, everything was about handsets. With 5G, it's not just about handsets. Handsets becomes an integral part. It's given, it's taken for granted. And by the way, as, as uh, Madhav mentioned, uh, one thing we should be very proud of in our country. This was the first time that we had 5G devices two years before the services or two and a half years before the services were launched. And Madhav was the first one who launched the first 5G device in India. It's, it needs a lot of courage, right? Today we are at some price point where we believe 50% of the market is going to be 5G this year. And next year, probably we'll have 150 million to 200 million 5G phones already in the country. So by the time the operators switch on the network, you're talking about a serious 80 million devices already existing, right? So that is one. Now coming to your question about the B2B, the, the way to look at 5G is it's not no more just about the smartphone. It's about everything also outside the smartphone because the first time it's a type of a horizontal platform. It, uh, it actually touches everything. Whether you take healthcare, whether you take industry 4.0, whether you take private networks. I'll take only one example because otherwise you can go in deeper into all of them. Take one example of private networks. Enterprises till now used to rely on less automation with all what we are seeing happening globally. Automation has become an integral part of any industry. 5G is going to help there. Operators will play a critical role in offering 5G private networks to the enterprises. I think that's one of the biggest and the fastest and the earliest service we see would likely see coming up in the industry use case. Uh, Raj Ramit, since uh, the topic of private network came up, I want to get your thoughts in. A lot of technology companies, big tech companies are asking for the government to give out the CNPN license, um, the captive non-public uh, license. Uh, you're accepting applications right now, but the DOT is still conducting demand studies. How soon before you think you can hand out the private uh, license for 5G for captive use? Uh, essentially, if you look at the policies that, uh, that has been already put in place, there are four ways to set up enterprises, networks. The, uh, the first three have already been enabled, I mean, I think, using the telecom service providers, uh, networks, and the spectrum. Right. So, and there is a third method by which I think you can also apply for a license and then get spectrum on lease from the telecom service providers. The fourth method, wherein we, we are proposing uh, a direct allocation of spectrum, I think the, there's a lot of work to be done. So I think essentially now we have undertaken a demand study, and then thereafter I think we'll need to unlock spectrum, because essentially some of the spectrum which TRI has recommended is already under primary use by some other users. So that has to be examined, and then after that we need to refer it back to TRI. So I think there's a long process, and I think it takes some time, I think. But what are the initial indications from your demand study? about direct allocation? Yeah, it's just about a few days old, you know, I think the platform. So I think maybe by early September, I think we'll have some idea of what kind of demand that we have. 
but we expect the demand to be reasonable because essentially if you look at the data which, which I think I can see from some of the international publications, there are, there are about some 600, 700 networks which are across the world. So I guess it will be a slow uptake, but I think definitely I think our policies will facilitate growth of enterprise networks. Do you think in two years we should be able to directly allocate? No, that is a matter I think to be dealt with in okay. due course of time. Uh, Anand, uh, coming on the topic of private networks, we speak to a lot of operators, private vendors, etc. And the feedback is that private networks are emerging a little more slowly than the bullish headlines seem to suggest. There are countless 5G pilots taking place and 5G handsets are taking off, but it will still be a while before private networks, 5G networks become the norm. Can you tell us what the global experience has been? See, I think when it comes the private networks, the policy itself became clear a few months back with the government allowing the private networks. So, and these are all long lead items, right? The setting up of the infrastructure, getting the, this one ready, working with the, <clears throat> finding the appropriate use cases, especially I believe that this is going to be more for, as Rajan mentioned, hazardous areas, ensuring that, you know, and uh, where there is security requirement or working in hazardous areas, be it in mines, so on and so forth, where there is large areas to be covered. All of this does take time and it also needs a partnership and there is also significant uh, use cases which needs to sort of get developed right there and, uh, and sort of then build on that. So it will take time, it is not going to be overnight because these are long lead items setting up of the infrastructure. The telecom operators are already way off the block because they have been preparing for, uh, for 5G services, for consumer, for B2B a couple of years prior, as uh, Mr. Rajaram mentioned. So I think that's going to take time, but definitely there is going to be opportunity, as I mentioned, for everyone, for the enterprises, for private. For, in, as far as private 5G networks are concerned, we will see, uh, we will see uh, interest from the telecom service provider. We will see large system integrators working closely with equipment manufacturers like us to sort of build those networks and, uh, and look at use cases around that. You know, one of the challenges we will possibly face in fostering this decade which is backed and powered by digital technologies is we will need a lot more by way of chips and semis, etc. Uh, so, Madhav, I would like you to come in. Now, thanks to the government's PLI scheme, India has emerged as the second largest manufacturer of handsets by volumes. But if I look at electronic goods and component as a whole, India perhaps is still operating below its potential because the electronic good and components import is the second highest after crude in our overall bill. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and what steps do you think more government aid needs to be taken since you are in this uh, space? I think uh, government has been taking a lot of initiatives in bringing the entire ecosystems of electronic components over here. For manufacturing of smartphones, we need more than 300 different set of components. The best part about it is that government has already taken initiatives from past few years. We have been, we have been bringing ecosystems and we have been relying less on imports. So now 60% of the components are still manufactured in India from the smartphones itself. So I think there is a lot of a way to go ahead, but probably I believe we are on the right track. We, along with the government, I think probably we will be able to bring the entire ecosystem back to India. Uh, Rajaraman, according to you, what will be the biggest challenge that we will face? The uh, 5G requires, I mean, obviously, uh, a very robust backhaul. So I think the, the government has actually recently released a policy for E-band allocation as, as well. So I think the operators will therefore have access to fairly uh, robust backhaul. But that should not be the end of the road. And I think we need to move for fiberization of towers. So I think that's, that's uh, currently around 35% well, of the mobile towers currently are fiberized. So we expect that, uh, that over the next uh, several years, we should be able to push it to about 70-80%. And for that, I think we need to, uh, we had put in place a very good, uh, good ROW policy, right of way policy. We essentially, fibers, fiber, optic fiber networks require ROW policies. And uh, state governments have been very considerate and they have worked cooperatively with the central government. And we have actually reduced the, the, the charges for, for laying optic fibers. The, the time uh, timelines for, for clearances and so on and so forth. So therefore, we believe that we are on the right track. I think we should be able to push towards greater fiberization in the next couple of years. Uh, Mr. Gupta, same question to you. India's aspiration is that we will become a digital powerhouse, globally competitive. What will be the biggest challenges that we'll face, according to you? Well, you know, 5G being on the higher, um, you know, bands, 
naturally the propagation is poor and that means a whole lot of new infrastructure, many more sites and like Mr. Rajaraman said, you have to connect the sites on fiber, there won't be any place for putting microwaves. That is the biggest challenge and I must compliment uh, DOT and in particular uh, Mr. Rajaraman because they have been so proactive in looking at this problem holistically. We have had extensive discussions as operators, as the digital infrastructure providers with the DOT on these issues and I, I believe the new ROW policy should be released soon. So absolutely another great example of ease of doing business. We are proactively, even before TRA has actually come out with the recommendations, DOT is coming out with the policy. That is the biggest impediment. And if we can solve this problem of street furniture availability, uh, you know, the right of way of laying fiber, uh, putting up the towers, I think we'll win this battle. Okay, I would like to get some closing comments in. Uh, Rajan, uh, what according to you are the biggest lessons that we can draw from global experience? Now, China launched its 5G services three years ago. Um, 5G is there in many other countries. What according to you are the lessons that we can draw? I think, uh, yeah, one is the lessons learned or what we can adapt. The good thing this time around is that unlike 4G where we were a lot delayed, uh, 5G is coming almost concurrent to where the global ramp ups are happening, right? We are around two and a half years behind. Some of the lessons learned globally are going to be implemented in India. In, let's take one example of a very clear global use case. For example, in case of 4G, Volti was Volti or voice over LT was one of the services which was otherwise called a premium service globally. India took it as a basic service. Now today India is probably with the largest country globally to leverage a very futuristic technology called Volti. Now that we have adopted it, it has become a global lesson. So what I see is in case of 5G also, what looks to be a lesson which we are learning from the global world, yes, eventually because of our scale and economics, we are going to be driving lessons for the world out of India rather than we learning out of, out of uh, the global markets. And I must say that in 5G, maybe we're two and a half years behind, 6G, both India and China have said 2030 is when we would be looking at 6G auctions. So we're going to be, you know, right there with uh, the rest of the world when it comes to 6G and we're bridging the gap very, very fast. Uh, Anand, um, you know, you constantly speak to a lot of companies. You're working with so many partners in this entire ecosystem. What are your conversations like? I think the conversations with our clients and our customers and governments are primarily around two or three areas. What could be, see, see one important thing is with this mobile economy, apps are becoming the business. Apps earlier on, applications were earlier on an adjunct to the business for supporting business. Today you look at everything that the Telangana secretary spoke earlier about or the earlier speaker spoke about. Apps are becoming the business. How do you enable the apps to sort of be more 5G ready, be, have more and more better user experience? That is what the conversation is. How do I sort of leverage the power of 5G which enables certain technologies like segment routing, which, which gives you a fit for use bandwidth is the way I would call it, right? Somebody needs a batch processing which requires a huge amount of data to go through. Somebody requires a very, very low latency to perform certain type of applications. I think those are the conversations that are going on both on the consumer front and, on the, and from a business perspective as well. Madhav, you said Realme has shipped out 5 million 5G handset. If we meet one year down the line, what would that number look like? Incrementally, if you're selling five phones, how many of them are 5G now? 50% uh, of our portfolios are 5G. As per some recent data which we studied about, by 2027 there will be 400, 500 million 5G users in India with handsets having on their hands. So I believe there's a huge potential of 5G. As I said, Anything about $150 going forward would be moving towards 5G probably. So more than our current 50% of our portfolio is 5G at this point of time. And we intend to continue to grow on that particular point. Uh, Mr. Rajaraman, one final question then. What is next on the government's agenda? What are the milestones we should expect? See, when we look at the previous generations of technologies in the telecom sector, I think the manufacturing and service I mean, design in India, that, that bus was missed. So this is where the government is very focused. I think the CEO Nithyag is there, I think, so here. 
so the pl the, the no yes so he he was the architect of the pli i mean revolution so essentially manufacturing in india i think is the biggest challenge i think so and therefore i think the pli scheme uh, has laid the foundation for getting in manufacturers within the country in which he talked talked about but i think we have gone one step further and we have also put in place a design linked insurance scheme i mean incentive scheme wherein we are providing incentives for companies to make designs in india I mean the ip should be registered in india so we are not resting with that we have a, a also we are also working with uh, on uh, research and development in fact we have uh, the budget announced a 5% uh, usof r&d fund so which will amount to about nearly about 500 crores per year so we are going to fund a number of companies uh, in india to actually to to do deep research and uh, come out with their own designs and let me say that in 4G, I think we have a number of uh, local companies who have come out with radio access networks. They have also come out with core designs. C dot has come out with its uh, 4G core, which has been tested recently. And in 5G, we are already there. I and mean, there are a number of companies with, with networks in a box for enterprise. There, there are companies which already have a radio access network. So I guess the focus will be on R&D and developing technologies which are domestic. And 5G will play, be the backbone to spur India's manufacturing. Gentlemen, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for your time, information and insight.